to start and honor you for coming on time, and we'll uh, try and keep our schedule. First of all, let me uh, welcome you and thank you for coming. When we birthed this idea this summer, John and I, the pastor here, uh, we were like, well, is this a good idea or not? And it's a timely topic. Most of us don't want to talk about it or prepare for it, but yet we know we have to. So uh, thank you for coming, and I hope that this uh, time will be useful for all of us. Um, a few uh, logistics. Um, if you need to go to the restroom, just go out the back doors and head to your left, and the restrooms are right down there. There's uh, waters and cookies and some treats back there for those of you that uh, are gluten-free, there's some gluten-free cookies. For those of you that like cookies that don't have nuts in them, there are cookies with no nuts in them. So anyway, feel free to help yourself. So uh, my name is Bill Farron, and I attend church here and have been asked to formalize really a lot of effort that goes on here at the church. And so we developed something called CCA Helps, which is Christ Church of Amherst Help Ministry. And um, over the course of the last two years, we've done a number of different things, but um, my thrust has always been to make sure that at least half of my efforts go to the people outside our church, um, because we think it's very important for our church to have a voice in the community and just to be part of the community that we worship in. So um, having said that, a lot of my time in the last year just through circumstances has been um, from clients who have come to me and said, I need help because I don't know if I'm organized enough and I'm getting older. So um, that was the idea of the Boomer Bulge. You know, I was born in 1951. My wife was born in 1949. So in December of this year, we'll be 73 and 75. I'm the younger. <laughs> and I, 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 know, I, I know age is uh, sensitive to some people, but we can't let it be sensitive because those of us that are in the boomer bulge, we know we're getting older and there's no denying it. So, you know, here we are. So anyway, I'm just going to take a few moments to talk to you about some very basic ideas, and then we'll turn it over to Carmen and Lisa, and they will continue on the presentation. So one of the first things I want to encourage us to do or urge you if you haven't started, encourage you if you have, and urge you if you haven't started, is to start organizing your aging life is what I will call it. You can put a plan together, but plans can change. And so it's often that we have to revisit the plans we've made because sometimes they don't make sense for what's happened in our life. So you can't have just one plan and say, oh, it's in the folder, we know it's gonna happen. Because there are many, many vulnerables and there are very many variables in our life. Secondly, um, it's always good to have a second set of eyes and ears, or maybe a third set, because we only know what we know, and I only know what I know. But someone else will come up with an idea and say, well, have you ever thought about this? No, I hadn't. So it's always good to have conversation, be a little bit transparent with people, and just bounce your ideas for getting older, aging, against other people because there's experiences in this room and in your community or in your tribe, as the young people say, where they know things a little bit different than we do. So I encourage you to listen today, to take notes. Um, we'll have a time um, after I speak and after Carmen and Lisa speak where it will allow for questions. And I can come around so everyone can hear the question. We can talk into the mic. But it's a small enough group that we can be intimate enough and ask good questions. So there's really three things that I want to focus on. Choosing an executor or a trustee. The second is our housing. 
And the third thing is our documents. Those are the three things I'll just briefly go on. So choosing an executor or a trustee is very, very important. A lot of times we will default to family members. And in fact, our son, our oldest son, well, he's my only son, but um, he is going to be our trustee because we, uh, we have a trust. But whether you have a, just a will or you have a trust or you have a complicated estate, it's very important to have that one person that you can trust to do the job that you are going to ask them to do. Trust is a huge issue. And secondly, the executor or the trustee needs to be able to have the resources and time to do what you're going to ask them to do. They may live close to you. My son lives in Virginia. And so whenever something happens where he's going to have to step in, he's going to have to take time off from work. He's going to have to travel up here to New Hampshire. Or we also have a home in Florida. He may have to go down to Florida. And so as you're thinking about the person or persons that you've identified, make sure that they are trustworthy, but also that they have the resources and the time to fulfill the plan that you've laid out. Very, very important. Now, family is not always the most convenient place to go to for an executor or a trustee. I don't want to get into that too much, but sometimes family cannot be the help that you need them to be, and you may have to go to an outside source. Or you may not have the luxury of having any family. I'm working with a client right now who just turned 78 years old this week. Her husband passed away two months ago. She has no children. And she lives alone. And so for her, identifying someone to help her out, she's like, well, who do I go to? And we've spent a lot of time interviewing different people, and she's finally found someone who she treats as a grandson. But she's, it's, a, it's a new family friend for her, and he said, I will do it for you. And he lives down in Massachusetts. She lives up here in Milford. So I hope that you have at least thought about finding that one or two people in either your family or in your community that can help you with your plan. Secondly, assisted living, skilled nursing facilities, or our housing. It struck me uh, this week as I was thinking about how I would talk about this, that the Hurricane Helene just changed the lives of thousands of people. And it was outside of their control. And I have to believe that there are baby boomers down in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida who had a plan in place and they had a home in place where they were going to age. And all that has changed. And it had nothing to do with their carelessness. It was an outside vulnerability that changed their life. So I'm here to caution us all that there are things out of our control that can change our plans. So it's always good to be revisiting your plans because circumstances change. And those families that are down there, it, the worst time to make a plan or to change a plan is when you're in crisis. And they're in crisis right now. So in New Hampshire, we're not um, subject to hurricanes necessarily, but we are subject to other catastrophes that can happen to say nothing of the catastrophes that can happen personally with our health. All of a sudden, we can have a health condition that we didn't see coming, and that will change the plans. Or perhaps um, if we're married or we have partners um, and one of our spouses is sick, but the other healthy spouse all of a sudden gets sicker, then you say, oh, well, how are we going to do this? So it's, it's very important that 
we keep talking about what our plans are when there are life events that change how we live. Housing in southern New Hampshire, I don't have to tell you, is extremely expensive. Assisted living in southern New Hampshire is extremely expensive. I was looking at some statistics and for what they might be worth, assuming that they're somewhat right, it's about $11,000 a month to be in an assisted living facility in southern New Hampshire. According to what I read, it's about $10,000 a month to be in a skilled nursing facility. Now that's an average. Some of them might be twelve or $13,000 a month. Some of them might be six or seven. And the care that you get in those facilities will depend on what you're going to pay or not pay. So there's a push in the government both at the federal level and at the state level to have boomers age in their homes. And that's a good push, I think, rather than going into a institutional and a neutral setting. But sometimes you can't age in your own home. But the problem we have with the expense of housing in our area is if you're living in a home now that might be worth at least $400,000, because it seems to be the very basic condominiums are now pricing at thirty-five, excuse me, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or your home is worth seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars. But it's not a place where you can age. You have to think about well, where can I age? Where can I have a master bedroom that's on the first floor? Where can I have a, a laundry facility that's accessible to me? that doesn't require stairs. So if you're living in your home now and you plan to age there, but you have detriments to your getting older because maybe the bedroom is on the second floor, maybe the washer and dryer is down in the basement, the time to make the retrofits is now because it's not gonna get cheaper next year. And you don't want to wait until you're in crisis to say, oh, we've got to get someplace on the first floor. Well, we've got to retrofit our place. I encourage you to make plans for where you're going to age in place to retrofit that facility today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Very, very important. Now, documentation. I thought I would do this by showing you some object lessons. As, as I said, um, we have two homes, one here in New Hampshire and one in Florida. So we have to think about portability. You all know what this is? Yeah, you have a, you have a document case? If you, yeah, see. Not everyone has a document case. All of my, all of our life documents that are important fit in that little crate right there. And we bring it around between Florida and New Hampshire because we don't know when we're going to need it and where or where our son has to access it. So you can get all your documents in a small place. You just have to take the time to call out you know, the last 15 years of your tax returns that you don't need anymore, throw them out, just, you know, uh, shred them. But you only need to keep, according to the IRS, three years. I would recommend that you keep seven on file because, well, I don't want to make a political statement about the IRS, but, <laughs> but seven years, you don't need 20 years of tax returns. You don't need five years of insurance documents that have now aged out. So take the time to cull your folders and whittle it down. It's part of the getting ready for aging. So let me take you through this bag. Right on the front, it says keys. Keys to the house, keys to the car, keys to a um, storage unit if you have a storage unit or the combination if it has a digital lock uh, a safety deposit box in a bank 
keys because in a crisis, someone has to be able to go find those keys. So this is a handy dandy book we have. Put a set of keys together so someone can get at your stuff if you can't. Oh, by the way, I put spend down up there and when I started researching what that was, I realized it was not appropriate to go into it um, here because it would take at least an hour to two hours to explain all the nuances of the spend down. So I, I apologize, I can't talk to it and still keep within the time limits. Um, but that's very, very important as well. I've got a document here. Eleven pages. Anybody want to take a guess what this is? No. But, well, there are some instructions in it, Allard. These are all the accounts. These are all the passwords. These are all the bills that get paid every month that come right out of your checking account because we find that real convenient to do. But when the time comes for someone to help you because you have a health issue or when we pass away, that executor, that trustee, they need access to accounts to pay the last month's bills, but then shut them off. And almost all of them in our world, they're all now account protected and they're password protected. And because of the great software we have where the software will remember your password, now we forget what those passwords are because Google remembers it. And you go, well, I don't know what that password is. So, so on our front page, all of our bank accounts, it lists the accounts, it lists the passwords, it lists the instructions for our son Michael to say, here's what this account is used for. Then we have our retirement funds in another account. Those accounts, those passwords are listed here. Second page goes on to insurance. Who are we insured by? What is the account and what is the password to get in to see what those benefits are? All of that is on page two. Our pension information, which we're fortunate enough to have, who's sending us money every month? Social security password and account. Then we move on to credit card accounts credit card account passwords. You get the flavor. But if you don't have this documented, the people that are gonna help you in your aging process are gonna be at a loss. And as much as you don't wanna put this stuff down, I encourage you, you have to put it down. You have to keep it in a safe place, but you've got to record it somewhere so that people can help you. It doesn't do anyone else any good if it's just it, it doesn't. Fourth page is all of our information related to our housing in Florida. Fifth page, all of our accounts associated with our living in New Hampshire. Then, for the rest of the document, it's all those accounts that we've opened up over the last 20 years, from Netflix to T-Mobile or Verizon or AT&T or whoever your provider is. Well, some of them don't matter, uh, but I have a Microsoft account. We have airline accounts. I'm not gonna go through them all, but there are four pages of these accounts, and I know you have similar volumes of accounts. And so you have to have similar passwords that are written out. 
every year before we go to Florida, I use that time um, as an anniversary to update. There's scratch marks on this page. I can guarantee you without you showing, I have crossouts and new passwords and new email addresses on at least half these documents. So every year I sit down and I say, okay, how do I revise this? How do I delete stuff that's no longer applicable? Because I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for my son, the trustee or the executor that you have to help you out, to make their job easier. They're gonna do this for you. They're gonna do this for us. But you can't leave them a big hole where they're hunting and pecking, going, where is this, what is this? So I encourage us all to keep a document and keep it in two places. I keep the second document with my son. I send it to him electronically. Sure, there's some risk there, but I'll take on that risk to know that he has the same information that I have. And lastly, keep talking to your executor or your trustee to make sure that they still are willing to do what you've asked them to do, or if you've had a life event that changes, to make them aware of it. It's very, very important so that there are no surprises. When my mother um, passed away, I was the executor of her accounts. And my mother was a very, um, uh, what's, the, what's the phrase that the new kids use today because they want to live in a, oh, minimalist, because they want to live in a small, tiny house. My, my mother was the original minimalist. And I've learned from her, by the way, and, and Donna would attribute to that. If I don't need it for the last two months, never mind six, I throw it out. Yeah, it's, it's from my mother. But anyway, as a minimalist as she was, I spent hours working to get her estate in order to make sure that everything was done the way that she had asked. So they're going to do a great service for us when we need their help. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen, and she's gonna introduce her two friends. My colleagues, <laughs> friends first. So I'm Jennifer, I've been um, at this church for about 20 years. Uh, I've been a nurse for about 37 years. A lot of it was spent doing hospice work, so our hearts are kindred like that. You may leave the uh, hospice world, but you never really leave it. Your, your heart and your passion is still there. Um, right now, I'm uh, working at St. Teresa's Long-Term Care as an MDS director. You don't need to know what that is. That's for sure. It's paperwork and insurance. Um, but I hope to bring um, clarity to end-of-life issues there, teach the staff, educate the patients and the families. Um, just, I'm not telling you how old I am, but I will tell you. <laughs> Um, just a little of experience. Uh, my parents are both gone. My dad died of an aneurysm suddenly. My mom had pulmonary fibrosis for 15 years. She was on hospice over a year. And so I've had the quick deaths and I had the long deaths. And my mom didn't have much, uh, so there wasn't much to go through, but I can tell you it was very emotional. And then I've had the opportunity recently to come alongside uh, a woman that just lost her husband. And the plans were in place. And I said, oh my goodness, how much easier this is. So I'm in the process of planning my funeral. I'm picking a plot, a headstone, I'm getting it all together. Um, but according to Bill, I got a, a lot more to do. So um, I'm gonna get on that as well. Um, but I just wanna say a little bit about healthcare. I've been talking about this for weeks. It's just come across my path. Um, we all wanna be self-determined, right? We wanna, we wanna make our own decisions in life, in healthcare, and maybe certainly at the end of our life too. Healthcare is not what it was. I don't know if any of you have been sick. COVID has changed everything, so be on top of things. Um, healthcare is different, acquiring healthcare is different. Um, I, maybe some of you here, it's hard to get appointments. It's hard to um, schedule appointments, get test results, things like that. So be very, very proactive in that. And I'm sure my friends here will talk about advanced directives. 
Bill talked about kind of finances and organization, but there's we can be just as deliberate with health care. So I've had the opportunity to share life with these women, and they have a heart and a passion and a skill um, to help us be self-determined later in our years. There's lots and lots of options out there. There's a lot that we don't know. So Lisa um, is a good friend, and I've worked with her uh, for many, many years, and we still continue to... Our lives still continue to touch. Um, you can tell us all where you work because we've changed jobs so quickly. I, I'm not quite so sure. And Carmen, also at the hospice house for years and years. She had a life in business before she came into nursing. Um, they're just two great, great people with great resources. And I'm glad you all came today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, yes, thank you for having us. I'm Carmen, and this is my colleague, Lisa. Um, so the presentation we've put together today is, there's a lot of topics and we could probably spend an hour on each one of those individually. So we're probably going to do a high point on most of them. And then if there's follow-up questions at the end, we might be able to delve into them a little further. But we just want to be conscious of your time today as well. So um, just a little bit, Lisa and I worked together at the Hospice House for about a decade and uh, have ushered families and loved ones through that dying process um, hundreds of times. And so we've seen things that have gone very well and we have seen things that have been challenging. And so what we have done as friends and colleagues in this space is think about how we can, in our community, help individuals make that be as best as it can be for them. Because what is important to me versus what's important to you and what's important to you can be very, very different. But having conversations about it allows people to really have what's best for them or what's important for them. So we're gonna talk about things like advanced care planning. So we have some copies of documents here. Um, if folks haven't put aside who their healthcare agent is going to be, they really need to think about that. Um, navigating healthcare itself. So Bill touched a little bit about that. So hospice and palliative care, what are those levels of care? Where do they overlap and where are they separate? And he also talked about aging in place and he really said, you've got to think about how am I going to age safely? And so we've really talked about the specifics. Bars on your bathroom and your shower, making changes, maybe do you need to build a ramp? Who can do that for you? There are entities in Southern New Hampshire that are approved by Medicaid that do those steps that can support what your needs are and meet requirements and sometimes even there's funds available there as well. Um, the New Hampshire Commission on Aging. So there's so much resource available in Southern New Hampshire. Now, much like Jen talked about healthcare is challenging now, there are challenges in working with the state because they have changes in their staffing and their availabilities, but their website is quite pretty robust and there's a lot of things that you can do. I mean, Meals on Wheels, we'll, we'll talk about all the things that are there, but there are resources and it's just taking that time to, to delve into them and find out what can be helpful for you. Uh, and then lastly, sort of the high level things, takeaway um, and tips. So um, Lisa and I, as we spoke, have worked together for a number of years. We've even delved into a nonprofit to do this work that we're doing today having conversations, talking with people, encouraging folks to take the stigma away from talking about death, because ultimately that's what we're doing. All the plans that Bill spoke of, all the things that he mentioned are to get yourself, your family, your loved ones prepared, comfortable, and able to accept that inevitable end that we're all going to face. But it doesn't have to be as scary. It can be something that is I think of it, and Lisa and I have talked about this before, it's a gift. It's a gift. If you give them these tools, they can be more comfortable in their work to help you. The shoulda, coulda, wouldas will haunt you. I, I've said that so many times. Oh, I should have done, oh, we would have done that if we know. Oh, we could have if we only knew what Grandma wanted. So have that conversation with her, even though it feels weird, right? It feels awkward. It's okay. It's okay to feel awkward, right? That's life. If everything was easy and comfortable, it wouldn't be fulfilling in the end, right? So that's sort of our mindset. So Joe, if you wanna go to the next slide, this is something, I, I love this quote, and I'll, I'll use it till, <laughs> till my last day, I love it. So Rosalind Carter, I, everyone knows, great 
part of it's been in hospice now, and he's, he's done such. 100. Yeah, he's turned a hundred. He yeah. wants to stay alive to vote. Like you know, he's just such an advocate for this tool that's in our society. But Rosalind Carter's quote is: "There are only four kinds of people in the world: those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver." And there is so much truth to that. So coming at it from that perspective is, I will be in each one of these positions through my life, and if I can be thoughtful in that and know what to do when I'm in those places or have a sense of how I'm gonna deal with it, the better off I'll be. So I think, Joe, the next slide talks really about more of Lisa and I's passion about what we wanna do and how we wanna accomplish this and how we want our community to think about how collectively we care for each other. Jen mentioned the, the state of our healthcare system is really challenging right now. And in the past, farming out care and farming out services to other entities in the community seemed great, right? A lot of things, but now it's like, well, those entities are overburdened. They are broken, like a lot of systems in healthcare are just not able to manage what they have now. What's going to happen when the boomers, in the huge capacity that there are, like, I don't know what the statistic is, but okay. so how many baby boomers turn 65 on a daily basis? I think it's like 10,000 a day. Every day there's yeah. another. How is the system that's already, like, feeling the burden, how is it going to deal with it? Well, we've got to get back to basics. Community taking care of community. How do we develop a network of people in our area that will be supportive? Who are our who are our support team? And we'll talk about that towards the end as well. Um, but making your wishes known, not just about what, okay, where's my passwords, where are my bank accounts, but what do I want? What do I want my experience to look like, to feel like, to sound like? I can't speak for anyone but myself. Yeah. I know what I want. I want music. I want to have my friends around me. I want to have joy. I want to be able to experience something that, you know, it's like this thing that is amazing, right? We're all going to go to this place and feel this wonderful experience. But, but you have to share that with people, right? right? You have to let them know. Right. You have to say, this is what I want. I want to have a huge celebration. Yeah. I want to have just an intimate thing, and I want to have just my friends and family. Okay, great. Maybe next month I feel totally different. I want to have a big celebration. But... conversations ongoing. It's not yeah. once and done. And as Bill said, things yeah. things evolve and you have to update things. So it's it's really hard at first to get comfortable talking about those topics, but once you open that door, from what I've seen and experienced myself, those conversations become less awkward, less weird, yeah. more comfortable and actually a, a natural part of conversations with your family, your friends, your loved ones. So more is better. Exactly. In that respect, right? I always say everyone has month-long conversations about how your wedding's going to be and who's right. going to be there and what or, you're wearing. Or the baby coming. Or right. Yeah. It's Someone's having a child. Oh, what, we're going to have a, what is that, a gender reveal. Like, all of these yeah. things. You're, you're doing all of this pomp and circumstance around something. But then, oh, well, what's going to happen when my child, oh, well, we can't talk about that. We can't talk about that. That, that makes it happen, right, if we talk about it. But it's just as important, it's just as much of a milestone, so give it as much attention as you would these other milestones in life. Make it just as important, because it is, really. It's such a significant part of life. And my thought is, if you think about it now, you almost can create a better experience in life if you're not thinking that there's things that are going to be held off at the end and someone else is going to have to, or I can't deal with it, or I'm not going to... It takes away from your current life and the experiences that you're having now and maybe some of the joy of it because there's this burden of thinking you need to do this thing or it's right. going to happen somehow or I, I don't know, I can't talk about those details because it makes me worried that things aren't going to go well or whatever it might be. And to Bill's point as well, waiting for a time of crisis or chaos is the worst time. Yeah. You're already vulnerable, you're already grieving, you're already in pain and to try to do logistical work on top of that is very, very difficult. Yeah. That actually intensifies complicated grief, makes it really hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. So things 
like death cafes, if ever if anyone ever heard about a death cafe. We, uh, we, we, we use all sorts of euphemisms, yeah. right? The legacy lounge, the mortality meetup, like all these places. Death by chocolate. Right, death by chocolate. <laughs> like we use all these euphemisms, done, but so. it's really just like this, a place to come and have a group of people get around the table and talk about what their questions are, what their fears are, what their concerns are. No judgment, open, easy, safe conversations. The more that's available to you, the more likely that you'll have those conversations and the more likely you will be able to express your, your wishes and, and have those conversations. Uh, so advanced care planning, that's very important. We've, I grabbed a couple of copies. I just printed them off. You can get them online. State of New Hampshire's website. Download if, them. Yeah. If you don't have a health care agent, if you live in Massachusetts, a health care proxy, durable power of attorney for health care, label it whatever you want. It's that person who will speak for you when you cannot. And it's not when you're 90 and you're unwell and you're in the hospital. It's when you're 65 and you're having knee surgery and you can't speak for yourself. Someone's going to be there and be able to talk to that doctor or talk to that surgeon and say, I know what Sally needs. I know what's important to her. So making sure that you work with the person, tell them you want them to be your health care proxy or your agent. Again, those conversations. Have those yeah. conversations. Again, telling them, this is what I would want. Should this happen, this is what I want to do. Should this happen, this is what I don't want to do. And I think sometimes that's the more important conversation, what I don't want. And that's everyone's individual choice. But telling someone is going to let them do and carry out your wishes as if you could do it for yourself. And you often should pick an, pick an alternate as well. I mean, because sometimes in life, right, life happens. Person A is not available. Right. Something has happened to them. They're out of town. They're on vacation. This just happened to my cousin recently. My aunt fell, and her number one person is her son, and he was in Greece on his honeymoon. <laughs> so my cousin, had, so his sister had to step in. If they didn't have an alternate, they wouldn't have someone who could have stepped in. So choosing your person and making sure they're comfortable and capable. We talked about family members. Sometimes that's not always a good choice. Right. Sometimes a family member isn't comfortable carrying out what your wish is. It can be too burdensome. It can be um, more than they're capable of emotionally. So if they're not, don't then say, I, I get that, and I don't want to put that burden on you. That's why I'm choosing another individual. Um, As we age, oftentimes there you see cognitive issues. So person A is, is great at, at 50, but as they age, perhaps they have a cognitive deficit that would prevent them from a, being able to make decisions. Yeah. So alternate, very important. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, all right, next slide, Joe, please. And so this really sort of goes into much of what I had just said. So I think these slides can be provided to folks. Afterwards, I'm happy to have this presentation given out. But this really spells it out. Make sure you know who you're choosing. Ensure that they're capable of making the decision for you and they can carry out those wishes. Keeping copies of these documents in safe places. Making sure your doctor's office has one. Each of your agents have one and you have a copy in your home somewhere. Because you will need to prove that when you go to the, the if there's an emergency, you go to the emergency, you need to show them, yes, I am Sally's, I am Phyllis's person. I am the person who's going to speak for them. As nurses, that's one of the first things we look for. Yeah. Advanced directives. When we have a patient, we ask them, do you have plans? Do you have wishes? And a lot of people don't. They really don't. Yeah. And we can help them with that. We've done that many, many, many times. Many times. Yes. This is something you don't need an attorney to do this. No. You just either need, you don't need a, not a notary. A notary. Um, to witness the signatures or two witnesses to witness the yeah. signatures, non-related, you know, that sort of thing. But there's a section in this where you can, there's like a free form section. You can say, I want this, I don't want that. Right. Please don't give me a feeding tube or yes, I would want to have intubation, whatever it might be. And there are, you know, do not resuscitate forms and physician uh, instructions for what, you know, you can do a lot of step-by-step -step instructions depending on what you really want to have done. But naming someone to speak for you is of the utmost importance. Because that could happen to any one of us at any time. Any time. Um, so Jen talked about this, and I think this is a great thing to make sure that you're talking about also. What do you want? Again, talking about a burial plot or what's going to happen at my funeral or. Would you even want a funeral? Yes, right. You know, do, how, do I, 
how do I want my body cared for? Do I want a funeral? Do I want a celebration of life? Am I looking, do I want to have a celebration of life now? Do I want to do this before? Do I want to have, people have um, unfortunate diagnoses, they know they have a terminal illness, they don't want to have a celebration without them, they want to have a celebration with them. And so some folks choose to have a celebration of life before. It also can lead into, when Bill was talking about leaving a gift for people and not leaving a mess, sometimes, even now, going through your belongings and telling people, well, I'm going to give this to you in my will. Okay, well, what if you gave it to them now and you got to see them wearing that beautiful necklace or having that ring and you told them, well, this is something that I, I don't know, you know, Fred gave this to me, he got it in Italy, and whatever, I don't know, whatever it might be, and I am so thrilled I want you to have it and I'd love to see you wear it. It'll be so, bring me so much joy. So, right, and have such meaning. Because sometimes I, 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 you get something at, um, after the end of someone's life and you go, oh, I didn't know Aunt Phyllis had this. I don't know what this is. I don't know what it's about. But if you start thinking about those things and what's important and what you want to give to someone and tell them that story, boy, does that have so much more meaning. Boy, does it have so much more value. So those are the things that isn't about funeral or burial, but it's about your legacy. I think of the word legacy a lot um, with these sorts of things. And I, I put a little snippet at the bottom. You can donate your body to research. You can have, um, there's forensics programs that you can donate your body to. There's embalming, there's green burial. You can have cremation. cremation. Like there's so many Composting, choices. Composting, all of this, so many options. Right, there's so many things that you can do. So if any of those things are important to you, if you don't tell someone, you can't make those decisions at the end. We, at the hospice house, we had that happen very often. Oh, you know, dad wanted to donate his body to science. Oh, okay. Do you have all of that paperwork in those documents? Oh, no, we just figured we'd do that um, when the time came. Well, that's not how it works. Yeah. If that's important to you, if you've had any time to research that, you know that is something you need to do very much ahead of time. You have to have it in place for um, the, all of the... Um, paperwork that you need to complete can take months sometimes. So yeah. it's not something that you can do at the end. So if that's what you want, tell someone so that you can get those things in place now um, and not feel like you couldn't carry through someone's wish because the time just wasn't afforded to you. Um, let's see. So this is uh, hopefully something that folks um, have been interested in understanding, which is the difference between hospice and palliative care. And if you have been diagnosed with a terminal illness and in that diagnosis, you're working with your healthcare providers and you're thinking, well, I'm gonna pursue curative treatment. I'd like to continue to have whatever that might be for whatever illness that you have, cardiac rehabilitation, chemotherapy for cancer, whatever it might be. In those choices, you can get robust care with social work support, um, spiritual care, having all of that be part of palliative care, which is I am still working towards curative measures. I want to have all the support I possibly can with that well-rounded holistic approach, but I am not at end of life. Hospice care is really meant for end of life. And I'll use the example of Jimmy Carter. The Medicaid criteria is six months or less. But it does not mean that's a hard and fast no, period of time. Best guess, right. based on provider. And right. Because, you know, physicians are smart, but they don't know. Right. This is really not a contract between them and you. It's a contract between you and your maker. <laughs> right? And so that process is different for everyone. So when you're feeling like all the work that I'm doing and all the care that I'm receiving and all the support that I'm getting is no longer reaching that goal, that curative goal, that's when you have a conversation with your medical providers and with your family and say, I'm really ready to have this be fully supportive and no longer having treatment or care that's associated with curative measures. And that doesn't mean you're not going to keep getting care. No. In actuality, it means you're going to get more, more care. care. And I think that's the big, I think that's the big piece that people, oh, they're going on hospice now. 
it, that's it. That's the end. They're not going to have anything now. They're not going to get anything now. And it's kind of the opposite. You're going to start getting so much more support because people know in that finite amount of time that you have left, your needs are so much greater. Your family needs are greater. And what is important to you in those moments might be having time with my family. It might be making sure, some people are so concerned, making sure that my last things at work are done. Make, right, I mean, I've seen it so many times, right? They'll, you know, John was working right up till the end. Well, because John was so focused that that is what he wanted to do. And if that's what you want your time to do, then great. I'm, I'm saying whatever's important to you is whatever's important to you. It's quality of life. Exactly. The focus is on. Exactly. And whatever that quality of life is for the individual, yeah. whatever is the fit. So this slide really talks about palliative care and who those team members are within your healthcare um, system. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Joe, this is really, I love this little graphic. It says, when you choose hospice, it's not saying, I'm going to make this happen now, if that's it. It's saying, I want to do this in the most comfortable, softest, easy landing way I can. I'm going to use the things that are available through hospice to help me have this be as best as it possibly can for me. People use the phrase, a good death. Well, I don't know what that is. I know what it is for me. I know what I think a good death is. And what I think a good death is today might be very, very different than what I think a good death is if six years from now someone tells me I have a terminal illness. I might feel differently about it. But that's okay, because you can change your mind. You can say, right now this is what I think is good, but I'll change my mind later if that's not where I am mentally and physically because I have illness. And I think the things I hope for are a little different than what I was hoping for when I was like, 10 years younger and not in that health. So, and it's okay to change your mind. That's how I feel about it. So next slide, please. Um, and this, again, uh, more explanation, and if this is helpful for people as far as having copies of these slides, um, you're welcome to. But hospice really is that defined period of time when a provider says, along with that patient, we feel that given the trajectory of your illness, it is likely that given its natural process, you have six months or less. But some people stay on for a year. Right. Some people stay or, on. Or they sign off hospice. Right. Because people, they sort of plateau. Right. And people graduate. They go yeah, off hospice. Yeah, they graduate. Yeah. yeah. And you can go right back on hospice. It's not a, once you signed on, that's it. You can never make a change. Or once you've graduated and come off of it, it doesn't mean you can never go back into it. So the, the benefit of hospice through Medicare or through your private insurance, whatever you have and whatever your age is at, gives you that flexibility of being able to come on and off hospice, depending right. on how you're feeling and how your illness is progressing. And the overall goal, I think, is to sort of meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. People like hospice say, I'm going to meet you where you are. Yeah. Meet you where you are. So this is a graphic. It's a little blurry, sorry. But it just sort of shows you how the two levels of care overlap with each other, where they are different. So no life expectancy limit life expectancy of six months. Both are covered under Medicare and Medicaid, um, but the quality of life and that emotional, spiritual, and physical support, especially things like pain management, um, things that are important when it comes to any symptoms that you might be having. So pain always, you know, pain always sits at the top. I can't people think of that the most, but what if you have an illness that causes nausea? What if you have an illness that causes you Increasing anxiety, anxiety yeah. like all of those sorts of things. So those become paramount in addressing during those final months um, versus palliative care where you might still be getting aggressive treatment and having maybe radiation and chemotherapy and that sort of thing. Um, I'll have you go to the next slide, Joe. So Bill talked uh, a lot about how do you start working and making plans now to have your house work for you when you're aging and your mobility changes and your strength might change. And so these are very specific things. So inside your home, grab bars in the bathroom, make have your shower be a walk-in shower so there's no tub that you have to go over. Handrails on all your stairs, or if you need to widen your doorways because you're now using a wheelchair or a walker for mobility. Um, ramps and chair lifts, if changing um, a sleeping, you know, a bedroom to the first floor isn't an option and you need to have one of those. Sometimes that's the most appropriate. Trip hazards, 
there are statistics, and I'm not going to be able to quote them off the top of my head, but falls in the home can be one of the biggest catalysts for um, a much more um, steep trajectory in someone's health. Yeah. Yeah. Um, single floor living, Bill talked about that as well, and proper lighting. I could not be, so my mom is almost 90, and I'm always like, why just the lights? She doesn't have any lights on in the kitchen. How does she see? <laughs> I was like, turn the lights on. She's right behind me, turn the lights off. Um, I have a feeling it's because she grew up in the Depression, and she's like, every light should be off. But, uh, uh, right? So, it is. But, and that applies to outside, too. So how many times do you come home at, you leave, especially this time of year, you leave during the day, yep. it's light up, but you come home at 7, oh, it's already dark, and I forgot to leave the outside light on, or I don't have motion sensor lights, and you know, you're fumbling with your phone thing, or your phone camera, or your phone light to get your key in, all that sort of stuff. Safety outside is important, too. Who's going to take care of your trash out if you're not physically capable to put your trash out anymore? Who's going to plow your driveway? Who's going to mow your lawn? All of those things suddenly become a lot more important if you physically can't do them anymore. So sometimes people already hire people out, but sometimes they don't, and if you haven't accounted like for that, yeah. yeah. So I think the next slide, Joe, um, just talks about other tools and services. So um, things that you can get. So we talk about um, St. Joe's Closet. If right. someone doesn't have the means to purchase some of these things, there are tools that are available, canes, walkers, wheelchairs. Yep, they're open every Tuesday, exactly 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, do video doorbells. Like, if you're not comfortable answering the door, there's, I, I think a brand name is like Ring. Ring, yeah. But th they have all sorts. But if that's a way for you to be able to use technology to know who's at your door, whether or not you're going to answer your door, um, using everyone, I think. If, I were, if this was a fire marshal speech, the fire detect the fire alarms and your carbon monoxide detectors. Right. But Guess what? If everyone's heating system in their home should be checked annually, and if it isn't checked annually and there's something wrong with it, a carbon monoxide detector is going to help you. So these are things in general we all should be thinking about, but as you age, it can be even more important because your reaction time to things might not be as rapid. Um, so I mentioned earlier, there's a gentleman, his name is Christopher Wrench. He actually used to work at Home Health and Hospice Care with us, but he has a home... Um, assessment and renovation company that is approved by Medicaid, and he will come and say, these are the things you should be doing in your home. These are the estimated costs. And there are other entities, but we know him, and so um, I wanted to mention him. But transportation assistance, maybe you need help getting to your appointments. Maybe someone needs to take you to the hairdresser now. You can't do that for yourself. So those are all little tasks, and we still want to get our hair done, girls, so how are we going to get that done? How are we going to manage that? There's services, so the state of New Hampshire's website, the um, New Hampshire Council on Aging has transportation services yeah. there. So again, you have to be patient, you have to work ahead of time because their resources are limited. Um, we've come to find that out as the post-COVID years, I think that's what we're calling them right now, as the post-COVID years. Yes. Navigating these things, are, it's, it's different. Um, and I can't say enough, have someone who's an advocate for you, have someone who you feel is a partner in this process, someone who can help you do all of the things that you need to do. It might not be your healthcare power of attorney. That's the person you want making healthcare decisions. It might be someone else, a valued family friend or someone who can say, oh, I'll make those phone calls or I'll sit with you and I'll help you sort of map out how you're gonna get that done. But don't feel like you have to do it all yourself, right? We're a community, we wanna help each other, right? So. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Joe, I think this is very much what I was just saying. Who is your support team? Your family, your friends, your spiritual group, your caregivers, your service providers. Your community. Yeah, your community. Um, and I, I'm going to keep referring back to it. We as a society are needing to support each other in a different way now. We're needing to come at what our needs are through life, through aging, in a different way because we're missing some of those big global services that used to exist, or those big global services are being overburdened. Um, and so if we can begin talking comfortably with each other about how do we navigate this, how do we get this through this part of our lives, you'll come to find out your community members are probably thinking the same things or needing or wanting the same things, and you can help each other. I think the last couple of slides 
so this is a, a picture of the um, state of New Hampshire's website. All of the links, I could go on for an hour yeah, with each of these links. So but, much information. And yeah. whatever is important to you. So some of the links that are having to do with transportation or meal services or support like that, or is it I need help with a Medicaid application right. process? Insurance, but Insurance, yeah. but like, yeah. but all of that sort of thing. Um, so they're there, and they're pretty robust. Um, so investigating that is a way to use a service that already exists through the state, which often is at low cost or no cost. So that can be important to some folks. Um, so this really sort of uh, high level touched on a number of things that I felt like were important, and that has to do with meal delivery services, home and community-based care, those long-term care um, supports. Do you want to stay in your home? How can you accomplish that? Do you have the funds to do it? Are there home services that are capable of accommodating that your care needs, those entities are sort of stretched um, to the max as well. So sometimes it's hard to acquire that support, right. finding someone to come water. and work in your home. Um, but the state of New Hampshire does have a robust volunteer program as well. So maybe you're not at a point where you need to help, but you're willing to help and you wanna volunteer. So there's volunteer options through them as well. And then I think the last couple of slides, yeah, are sort of takeaways. So I could not reiterate more strongly, when you are making your wishes known and you're asking someone to carry things out for you, and, and Bill mentioned this too, choose a strong advocate. Choose someone who is willing to speak for you, willing to do the things that you're asking them to do. And that's not judgmental in any way, it's more don't ask someone you know that it might be even harder for them to do the things that you're asking. Because then you're giving someone a, a task that's maybe beyond what they're capable of doing. So a strong advocate, someone who's willing to get on the phone, talk to doctor's offices, talk to other entities, someone who um, can speak for you when you cannot speak for yourself. But personal care, finances, funeral, navigating that healthcare system, asking those honest questions of your healthcare providers, Telling, having that honest conversation with your family. It, I, again, I know it feels weird, sometimes it's uncomfortable, but it's short-term discomfort for a real long time, getting you there and comfort. Um, using those services available through the state, federal agencies, um, and making those safety measures in your home. Again, a lot of this is repetitive, but it's because those things are so vital. And really, that's sort of the end of Lisa and Mai's presentation. Um, if at all possible, I just love this little quote. Again, I love Rosalind Carter, and then I, I love, um, this is so good. It, so everyone knows who Jane Goodall is, right? Um, so I'm sort of blocking people. If, see if it'll make it go. I just love her saying, hey, listen, I, I don't know for sure. I can't, prove, she's a scientist, right? She's yeah. a biology, I can't prove it, but I think there's something else. And that's such a great, the, the next great adventure. I just love the way she termed it. So I like to end with that. So I guess we can open it up to questions. Thank you, Lisa and Carmen. So, as I said at the beginning, I want this to be an encouraging time or an urging time. If you have not begun many of these processes, choose to start. You can ask me later, you can ask them later for help. There's plenty of people that will help but you have to ask. And I always tell that to the clients that come to me, mostly through the SHARE organization. 
And I'll say, you have to ask me for help, and then I'll find the help that you need. So with that, um, before we do some Q&A, I forgot one small little detail, and then I want to um, identify one person here. It looks like Michael maybe had to leave. For your um, checking accounts, my good wife was a banker in her career. And when the time comes that you don't have physical abilities to access your bank accounts, or you have passed away, your bank needs to have on file one of two things, durable power of attorney, and you need to go to your bank and ask them, will they keep that on file electronically because there's so many different branches. And then there's a little titling you can do on at least one of your bank accounts called payable on death. It doesn't cost anything, but you can notify the bank that, you know, for my checking account, Michael Farron has um, ability to write checks on this account to finish off paying the bills, close out the accounts, payable on death. It's simple, it's free. You just title it that way to at least one of your accounts. Um, Emily, could you stand up? Emily uh, attends our church here, and she is a doctor of physical therapy. And she had notified me this week that many elderly people suffer from vertigo or other physical ailments. And Emily has um, techniques and strategies that can be used to eliminate that or at least bring it down. And so she's willing to take any questions afterwards. If you or you know you have some loved ones that suffer from, from physical ailments, uh, Emily would be happy to speak with you. Okay, thanks Emily. And then uh, Michael uh, Fox was here earlier, but he told me he had to leave, um, so I can't really introduce him. But um, if I can give you his name and address, if you have questions about long-term care or insurance products or choosing, we're coming up to our nomination time for new um, insurance coverage for 2025, starts in October and ends in November. Um, Michael is someone who will sit down with you for free and talk through any of those insurance uh, questions that you may have. So with that in mind, if there's any questions, I'll come and you can ask a question. Joe, you have a question. No, that, that's a difficult one because usually the two-step verification, and a great question, Joe, usually they're going to text your phone or uh, send you an email. So you've, that's a difficult one to get a hurdle over. I'm not sure how to do that except to have instructions to your trustee or your executor, how do you get into my phone? And do you have a, uh, is your phone password protected? Mine is, and now that you say that, Joe, I haven't put that in my document. <laughs> my, the password to my phone and the password to Donna's phone. We gotta add that. You did it, yeah. <laughs> my good wife. <laughs> yeah, it, it does take a tribe to do all this. We cannot do it alone, nor do we want to do it alone. So I'll shut up. Um, but if there's any questions, I'll come around. You can speak into the mic. No? No questions? Yep. I don't really have a question. I, I just want to applaud what's happened here. I, I get on a soapbox with a lot of my mature friends that we need, because I'm the same age as Donna, okay? <laughs> so it's okay, Donna. It's okay. I, am, I get on a soapbox because they need to let people know. I want a party. I want balloons. I want dancing in the aisles. I don't want flowers. I just want a party. I want, them, I want everybody to know where I've gone. And even if I have to do a videotape, I'll give them direction. But 
I just applaud you because so often we don't take into consideration that that person, even if we've already talked to them, that's going to be an emotional time for them. I just spent eight months, it'll be two years in December, with a very good friend of mine. She had no family. She was a widow. She trusted me. She was in in-home hospice for eight months. When she went in, they only gave her two. But I did such good care that she... But that time with her, and I think that's one of the things that maybe you didn't talk about, it, it can be really special. She, she went home to be the Lord in December, and we talked for weeks about what it was going to be like to celebrate Jesus' birthday with him. I, I, I'm not a caregiver. I, I really, that's not my gifting. But it was the best thing that I could have ever done. And from this side of it, trust me, you can do it if all things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. And believe me, that scripture kept being repeated lots of times. But I just applaud you, and I thank you very much. I came to this because I wanted to make sure that what I'm doing, and I've got mine in place, and I tell everybody, you know, I want a party. I want a party. I, you know, my doctor knows what I will accept and what I won't accept. I mean, there, I've got all my people in place. But one of the things is, all my people are my age. So I've had to find somebody that can come in. So thank you for, for what you're doing. I praise the Lord for you. Yeah, Alan. I don't know about the rest of you, but I was going to go out to lunch, but now I'm just going to go home and start digging out paperwork. <laughs> it's overwhelming. But seriously, I'm wondering about, um, do you have any ideas? Because the amount of work that the executor no matter how much we do, is going to end up with. Is there some way of compensating or some ideas? Uh, another good question, and it is a lot of work. When I um, was asked by my mother to close out her estate, um, my siblings told me I had permission to pay myself for my time. And that was a very important thing for me. I was willing to do it for free because my mother. But they said, no, you're going to take time and you're going to spend time doing this. You know, give yourself some money out of their account to compensate for your time. So that was permission that I got that I was glad I did. You can write that down. You can write that down. Yep. Jim? Uh, I was a, a co-executor with a bank when my father passed away. Um, and that had some benefit to it, being a co-executor, but it also slows down the process in some ways. So that, that's something that might be worth thinking about. And Bill, you were talking about your son, Michael. Um, so sometimes a co-executor is, is helpful to have a fiduciary involved. But here's a question. Um, a lot of us have more than one account. Do you see benefit in having more than one uh, child, for example, being a co-signer on different accounts, or does that just confuse things? Has that, anybody had any experience with that? I can speak to that just briefly personally. Go ahead. Go ahead. I live here locally in New Hampshire, and my sister lives in Michigan, but she is a signer as well because if for some reason um, I was unable to, she is far away, but she could still authorize it. Um, so having two people makes sense because either way, someone else can step in if one person is unable to. And that's, we did that, you know, we talked with our estate attorney about what would be best. Not all of the accounts, but there's one that's in trust so that she can do it as well. So I don't know if that's sound advice for everyone. Everyone's financial circumstances are different. 
and some people, everybody lives locally, and some people, not everyone lives locally, but that's how we addressed it, so that someone could do things if something happened to me, because if it was just me, you never know, right? Life happens. Yep. Um, I don't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> So an executor generally is attached to a uh, last will and testament. A trustee is generally attached to a trust that is going to manage the estate. Okay, so that, that would be the difference, but the function is the same. However, to be legal, and I know some people haven't done this, when you pass away and you have a last will and testament, you are to file that with a probate court. And that's where the executor um, comes in to be able to say, I'm the named executor. But there has to be some funds and time available for probate to work its way through. The advantage of having a revocable trust is you can avoid probate, but you're going to pay money to have a revocable trust done. Um, in our case, our son is our trustee, and we have um, two other people identified as secondary trustees in case Michael can't or won't be a trustee. Rick, you have a question? Oh. Medicare sends us to, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, they send one to Vicki, but not to me. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but, you know, the 2025 version, there are a lot of changes, new things coming, drug costs that changed. Um, these usually come in the mail and go in the trash in two seconds. They shouldn't, you know, take the time. Medicare is making lots of changes this year, and you almost need to go page by page. It's like about 90 pages. And then um, at some point, Evelyn, I would like you to just mention – you and I, the doctor that you have, and the way that you do medical care through her um, is worth, I, uh, you go ahead and share, I don't remember. What's her name? I don't want to Her name is Belinda Castor, Dr. P Dr. Castor, and she has a unique practice that um, she does not, process through insurance you can process through insurance i'm i'm on i'm on medicare but you um pay a i'm not even sure what the name of it that she does you pay so much per month like a subscription and then she just does everything it's amazing it's amazing She's a Christian, number one, so there's a spiritual um, component to your care. She also has an entire prayer team that prays for those people that are willing to let them pray for their care and with, with her as well. She's, she's an amazing woman. I mean, she already knows how, what? Okay. It's called an Integra program, and she she's amazing. And I'm I'm not sure this is a good commercial, but when when I had my stroke, within a half hour she was at the hospital. I mean, she was right there, and um, you know, 
she, she's just an amazing, amazing, amazing doctor. Her name is Belinda Castor, C-A-S-T-O-R. She's, she's, she has her own practice. It's yeah. in Manchester, in Manchester, I'm sorry, in Manchester. Um, I don't know the whole, just put her name in, you'll, you'll find her. I mean, I can give you the number for the practice, but she's, she, it's, we need to be, we need to be looking at things because you said earlier about the healthcare. I have so many friends that are struggling with getting in to see a doctor with the referrals, with Every, just what you said before, it's awful, it's awful. That's why they still call it the practice of medicine, I guess. But it's, you know, it's just terrible. So you, you gotta look at options. You gotta look at other ways of, the same way we do anything else, other ways of doing business. Okay, I, I want to um, honor time. So it's um, about 1.15, and we said we'd try and go about 70 or 80 minutes. You're welcome to stay and ask questions, but again, just to honor your time, or if you have to get someplace else, you know, we'll say we're done. Sure. But feel free to stay around if you have questions for uh, Lisa and Carmen or myself. I just, we have, um, we usually, when we do these presentations, your name and your email address, if you'd like to get materials from us, follow, if you have follow-up questions, if you would like us to come and present more in-depth on one particular topic versus such broad topics that we did today, um, we're happy to. I have a number of books here. Um, one of my favorites is The Beginner's Guide to the End, it's something that really puts things in simple terms and helps people navigate this process because an hour, one Sunday, sometimes isn't enough. You need something to refer to. So we, I brought a number of books as well. So okay. thank you so much for, for having us come today. We thank, really appreciate it. Thank you time. guys.